G6PD also in Mediterranean climates gives resistance to malaria. The Duffy blood group, the blood group molecule on the surface of the red cell is the molecule used for Vivax malaria to infect the red cell. And so Duffy null is essentially fixed in equatorial Africa, not in southern Africa. The Khoisan do not have it. They don't have a malarial environment. And it's extremely rare out of Africa, basically, until more recent migration, the gene didn't leave Africa. I just mentioned lactase. Um, alcohol dehydrogenase um, that I've worked on um, also shows evidence of selection. I'll come to that in a bit. Um, so many um, others are candidates. So here are samples that we study in our lab at Yale. It's taken over 25 years to accumulate. We're, it's about 2,800 individuals from 57 populations around the world, um, all as transformed lymphoblast cell lines, which in itself is a major effort. Um, and so we have infinite amounts of DNA on these. We can just thaw another ampule of cells out, grow it up, and isolate more DNA if we run out. Uh, purified DNA is not finite. It's a very, very stable molecule, but it doesn't survive a student dropping the tube on the floor. So notice we're reasonably decent in this part of Africa and some in um, Eastern Africa. Nothing here, nothing here, nothing here. We're sort of OK in the Middle East. Um, we've got a fair number of European samples. Um, only one Indian, and look at this huge part of the world where we have no samples. Um, right along the coast of Asia, we've got lots of samples. When you talk about Asians, most people are talking only about a few of these populations. But all of this is Asia. We've got some Melanesian and uh, Micronesian, a few North American and South American natives, obviously, because this is all funded by NIH, we have European Americans and African Americans. But for anthropological studies, they're not of much value. Um, so just remember, when you see things like this, um, it represents a subset of human variation that is not randomly selected from around the world. But notice, one, the bootstrap values for every red dot are 100%. The bootstrap means if we scramble, resample, and draw another tree, 100% of the time, the populations on one side of that segment of the tree are separated from the populations on the other side. Doesn't say they're always in the same order up here, but 100% of the time, 
the tree can be divided at that point, signifying highly significant genetic difference. So lots of those red dots among the African populations. And the length of the segment is proportional to, theoretically, evolutionary time divided by population size. So related to genetic drift modified by migration between populations. So even though there are very small differences up here between the uh, Yoruba and Igbo from Nigeria who are two um, Bantu-speaking groups and the Hausa from Nigeria, which is not Bantu-speaking, it is still a highly significant genetic difference, albeit small. And it's based, you can see, on a lot of DNA markers, a lot of time collecting the data. The Middle East, Ashkenazi Jews fall in there, as do the Druze and the Yemenites and the Samaritans. Everybody know who the Samaritans are? In the Christian New Testament, there was the Good Samaritan. It's come to mean good. There are medical outfits, hospitals called Samaritan without the good on it. But it, he was just a good man from the Samaritan tribe. That tribe still exists, reproductively isolated, at least since biblical times. A hundred years ago, there were only a hundred left. The population is currently around five or six hundred. Uh, reproductively isolated, Lots, a small population, lots of genetic drift, hence a long branch in this tree, but clearly anchored in the Middle East. Then we come to this group. If you've seen one European, you've seen them all. There's Virtually, well, here there is no highly significant variation among these Europeans. At some loci, there is very highly significant, but overall, there isn't. Then, a lot of difference as we think about human expansion. What are we doing here? We're going from the Ethiopians out of Africa huge loss of genetic variation into the Middle East, branching in one direction into Europe, branching in the other way across Asia, up into Western Siberia, out of Central Asia into the Americas, and into Eastern Siberia, into the Pacific, into the far east of Asia. So this fits basically what we can infer from many other aspects of anthropology and archaeology of how humans spread around the world. We can look at those same individuals in a principal component analysis, trying to plot them. Again, here we have Africa with the pygmies, um, coming through, here are African Americans, the Ethiopian Jews. Here we have uh, Middle East as squares, Europe. Then we're branching um, sort of into Siberia. Here's East Asia, the Pacific. Here are North Americans and South Americans. Notice. Native Americans didn't come from Far East Asia. 
they are not closely related to Far East Asia. It's a very independent uh, set of migrations and differentiations. Now, along the lines of there being no races, genetic variation is distributed in a very quasi-continuous way. Here are genetic distances from the two populations furthest away in that tree that I showed two slides ago. The, the Mabuti pygmies and the Keratiana from South America. And here is how each one relates to every other population. So here is the Mabuti, identical. Here the other pygmy. Um, and then the other Africans are similar. We get to Ethiopia. We get out of Africa, Europeans. And then here we're into some of the Pacific, then East Asia. And here are um, two Pacific Islanders, and then North America and South America. And here, coming the other way, from the Keratiana to the other Native Americans, very similar, then jumping into the Pacific. These are um, a tile from the eastern side of uh, Taiwan, the um, aboriginals on Taiwan, then East Asians, um, My Melanesians, Micronesians, Europeans, Middle East, and then the Africans. Again, sort of in the reverse order from cl closest to um, the Middle East into the pygmies. So, yes, there's some discontinuity or large jumps, but we don't have many populations intermediate in those regions, which might make things smoother. <coughs> so here's just a rainbow example of why I think the US is so absurdly focused on race and the classifications. Our country was founded by Native Americans, but I've only got three dots here. But if, even if we ignore Native Americans, we have founding populations from Western Europe, initially, not Eastern, etc., from West Africa, not East Africa, and from Far East Asia. Coming from California, there are huge Chinese and Japanese communities that started with the gold rush days and building the railroads. Those look very distinct if you just look at those far distant populations. But there's a genetic gradient between them. So it's this disparity of sampling that I think gives so many people the idea, plus the confusion of culture with biology, that there are distinct races. Of course there are differences. As I mentioned earlier, the expectation allele frequencies will be different in different populations. Primarily, we think random genetic drift that accumulated as small groups of people advanced as we spread around the world to occupy it, or our ancestors did. Um, some genes in some parts of the world have changed more recently, and I'm sure we're still evolving. 
but most of this variation is normal. Even genes that give different enzyme activities. I've studied catecholomethyltransferase. It's thought to be associated with risk of various psychiatric disorders. May be associated with risk, but there are probably all three genotypes for the rapid versus slow alleles at this locus in this room. Because while it may be an increased risk, it's still only a small difference between having the susceptible form and not having it. In neither case is the risk very high. So that's part of what gives us um, differences. I mentioned here hypertension. That's also a difference. It's only one recent, and I don't have the example here, a finding of one particular gene um, that seems to be the cause of the African-American high risk of kidney failure compared to any other population. And it's a gene that occurs at a 20% 20, 20 frequency in Africa and a high frequency in African-Americans and is almost entirely the explanation because of the very high risk of kidney failure if you have that particular allele. Now, here are three examples of high FST markers that are very good ancestry informative markers. So we have DARC. That's the official locus name for the Duffy blood group uh, locus. And the um, allele that gives resistance to uh, Vivax malaria, essentially fixed in Africa and virtually absent every place else, where we do see it in uh, here. Come on. Here we see it in one Maya individual, and I'm not sure who those two are. But we know Native Americans, current Native American populations have, in many cases, a small amount of African admixture because that's where escaped slaves went. The orange is one of the skin color alleles. And presence of this allele is strongly associated with lighter skin color. It's associated biologically with transport of melanin granules. So there's a clear biological relevance. And the ADH1B, this gray, is a rapid metabolizing form of alcohol dehydrogenase. And at least in East Asia, it is strongly associated with the flushing reaction. And I'm sure all of you have an Asian friend who, with three sips of wine, starts turning bright red. Here is another way of representing variation. Each little triangle is where a population has been studied. And um, these are data in the, from the Alfred database. Um, does it make much difference whether you have wet or dry earwax? But there's a genetic variant that determines that.
a quick go through because I've studied alcohol dehydrogenase a lot. Here are three variants in the same gene. They tend to occur on different chromosomes, except the two green ones almost always occur on the same chromosome, the two variants. So you see, the, at least in Europe, the two greens are superimposed, but then they become different in East Asia. They're not on the same chromosomes. Um, the orange is a variant that's African-specific. Another gene in the complex, um, here the two pink variants are all around the world, essentially on the same chromosome, both amino acid substitutions. And you can see they're up to 50% in many parts of the world. The differences in how rapidly you metabolize ethanol. And yet, they're perfectly normal, but they vary around the world in their frequencies. Two other of the metabolic genes, where again you can see there is significant variation around the world for that promoter variant, the light blue. And the other two show some variation um, around the world, with one of them essentially fixed, showing no variation in East Asia. And so here is a, another one of these frequency plots of this rapid metabolizing form I showed you earlier in cross-section. But here, it's been studied in maybe a dozen, no, a hundred different papers. We've accumulated the data. So every little red triangle is a data point. And you can see there's a very high frequency, greater than 40% along Far East Asia, and another section of high frequency in Southwest Asia. And the second enzyme in the alcohol metabolism pathway, aldehyde dehydrogenase 2, has a null allele that is very locally defined only in Far East Asia, primarily in South Eastern Far East Asia. And that's the one that really is the primary cause of the flushing reaction because it slows down and in the homozygote blocks degradation of the intermediate product, which is Alde uh, acid aldehyde, a toxin. And the accumulation of that toxin gives rise to the physiological reaction of flushing and nausea and headaches. All of the students in my lab who have worked on this project have been of East Asian origin. They've understood the phenotype very well. <laughs> so. That's a bit about variation and geographic variation. What about what a person looks like? So there are four primary skin color and eye color genes. There are many more, but four have been studied most. The golden, the matte P, um, ocular albinism 2 and melanocortin 1 receptor. Uh, they're all expressed in skin, affect the processing of melanin, melanin granules. Um, and in some cases, they're homologous to uh, genes and mutations in other individuals. 
And here are how the four are distributed around the world. Do you notice a Eurocentric aspect of this? Um, well, where have most of the skin color studies been done? And so this is something in population genetics we have to be very conscious of, that there is a strong ascertainment bias for European ethnicity because that's where most of the research has been done. Even in the US, European Americans are by far the most commonly studied population. So all of these are polymorphic in all of these populations, even in Europe, but they have different distributions and consequences. Let me skip that. Just before we break, let me just mention uh, one of the resources on the web. Are you familiar, have any of you come up with the University of California Santa Cruz genome browser? It is great, it's free, it's online, it's fast. It can do hundreds of things that I don't know how to do. But it's very good if you go in and I just typed in to search for ADH1B, and here is a schematic of the gene um, with the introns and exons and the three prime untranslated region and sequences that are available from other organisms across the comparable region, one can zoom in on a small segment of DNA uh, here near the three prime untranslated, no, this one of the introns, and get the actual sequence in all the other individuals, find out about polymorphisms, tremendous amount of information. So, if somebody talks about a gene and you want a little information, that's probably one of the first places to go. So, let me take a little break um, and see if there are questions. I should have said you can stop me at any time if you want if I haven't explained anything, and that will apply going forward. Ask yes. A couple of questions. Um, I noticed that you have um, samples that, that you use that you were talking about in a certain area that I'm interested in. Do you mind if I ask you about those samples in particular? No. Uh, the, the Mexican sample that you use is made up of 21 individuals. How diverse is that from across Mexico? Do you know offhand? We have two samples from Mexico. We have a sample of Mexican Pima, where, um, yeah, um, we actually have some children, but they're related, that, those are the unrelated. Um, we have a sample of Maya from the Yucatan, and they come uh, from one village uh, in Campeche, uh, state, they um, our understanding is that that area, when one of the revolts of Native Americans against the Spanish government occurred, um, that area was a refuge area for a lot of Maya from across the Mayan region. So how well it represents the region more broadly, we do not know. Um, but it was only one relatively isolated village in the middle where most of their people had been raised 
nearby and their parents and grandparents were from nearby. Um, how well do those two populations represent variation of Native Americans in Mexico? Not well at all, but it's all we've got. Um, would I like to see more? Yes. Um, most Mexicans um, are fairly significantly admixed these days. So we've tried to get relatively unadmixed populations. And our tree structure argues we've been relatively successful. But uh, on the other hand, we know in our Mayan sample, we have seen alleles we've only <coughs> otherwise seen in Africans or only otherwise seen in a European. The same with our Quechua sample. Uh, they're not African, but European. And yet, in those few instances we've seen these, it's been in different individuals. And they don't know they're probably don't know they have this in their ancestry because it was, you know, how much do you know about your five generations ago ancestors? Yeah. I, I may have missed this part, but you said that the Native American did not come from the Strait. No, I said they didn't come from Far East Asia. Of course, they came out of Central Asia, or a route more in Central Asia went north. Clearly, they crossed Beringia. And there is clearly a cline of variation from north to south, even within the Native Americans as they spread. I'm just curious because the Yeah. No. No. Oh, is it an alcohol Not those alcohol dehydrogenase okay. variants. Uh, I, we identified another variant that is only in Native Americans. We don't know what its functional consequences are. Okay. It hasn't been studied in that sense. Just two questions on human migration then. Um, what about the possibility of, uh, by, by some of those ancestral uh, markers that you were noting, uh, what about some sort of Micronesian or South Pacific Islanders getting up on the storm or whatever? I assume that the climb that you mentioned progresses from Europe, uh, sorry, from Asia, from the north to the south. It's not right. across and then up. Correct. Okay. And the other is, for how long do you think the African continent was basically sitting there and brewing before it finally burst out through it? Would that have been what, an ice age ending? Around 100,000 years ago, the sea level was lower. One, it was one of the more glacial maxima. Um, and so it's not clear whether it would have been up through the Sinai or across the bottom of the Red Sea or both. Um, we just don't have fine enough distinctions genetically to be able to do that because too many things have happened subsequently. Um, it's not at all clear that the transition to Homo sapiens re resulted in a major bottleneck in genetic variation. Uh, we've looked at one locus where the coalescent, meaning the, the point at which current alleles 
would have had a single common ancestor is approximately 800,000 years ago. So that means that even 200,000 years ago, there was probably residual polymorphism at that locus in the Homo sapiens population. And the genetic variation is very high in Africa, and, um, but it's high within every population, not just among populations. And so in a sense, uh, there's an element of homogeneity. The same variants occur all around the continent. Um, slightly different frequencies, which is why things are so similar. Uh, and yet, across many loci, it's highly significant. Mm -hmm.